Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another instalment of the Centre of Excellence uh, seminar series. I would like to begin by acknowledging that this meeting is being hosted on the traditional lands of the Bindal people and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Thanks, Eva. Um, look, everybody, you're about to hear a seminar from an outstanding young early career researcher, Jody. Um, when Jody came to me many years ago, it's actually many years now, um, to talk about an honours, um, her love of maths was very, very clear, and which really moved on to the possibility of biophysical modelling. And that was a, a collaboration with um, Professor Eric Wolanski and myself, um, where Jody was a willing participant. Um, but we were very explicit early on in that, that um, physical oceanography is one thing, but to make these biophysical models accurate, um, we wanted decent biological information. And I, I guess to paraphrase the, um, the good Professor Bellwood, um, slightly adapted from what he actually said, uh, you know, rubbish in equals rubbish out, and we didn't actually want that. Um, Jody's first project was on biophysical modelling, looking at uh, Snapper on the Southern Great Barrier Reef, where she demonstrated that rare events were quite important in terms of the recruitment of Snapper. And these are rare oceanographic events that you, you wouldn't have considered particularly important if you averaged the entire season. Um, she went on to study animals which actually don't have a brain, but appear to have quite complex behavior. These are the jellyfish, in particular, the deadly stinger, Chironix flickeri, and a not so deadly character, um, Copula civicis. You're going to hear a lot about that from Jody um, as the seminar moves on. And I think what will be very clear to you is that when you look at Jody's work, she's exceptionally careful. Um, and one thing that always impressed me about Jody was that her desire to ground truth the oceanographic model to the best of her ability and to get the best possible biological data um, was very obvious to make the accuracy of these, um, uh, these stories very, very clear. Now, Jody has now lurched back to the vertebrates from the... Um, uh, from the invertebrates uh, for more exciting uh, work on biological oceanography. She has a unique set of skills. And Jody, I now ask you to tell, to tell your story. We look forward to it. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks very much for the introduction, Mike. That was lovely. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about how biophysical interactions can shape populations. Uh, so this talk is focused on my PhD work with uh, cubozoan and jellyfish populations. Uh, so I'd like to start by just talking about how uh, spe aquatic species, how their populations tend to be structured. Uh, so species hold distributions, it can be made up of uh, one or more metapopulations, and their metapopulations uh, are in turn made up of stocks. Uh, so stock units are largely self-contained. There's little potential for emigration or emigration between them. And that means the biomass within stocks is uh, principally determined by intrinsic factors uh, such as recruitment growth and mortality. And then in turn, stocks are made up of uh, connected local populations. Uh, so populations uh, tend to be considered closed at the spatial scale of stocks. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this can happen at surprisingly small spatial scales. So uh, this example comes from the Scyphozoan uh, jellyfish Catastylus mosaicus off the coast of New South Wales. Uh, so sampling the bays up and down the coast, uh, Medusa in the bays revealed they had distinct uh, abundance and recruitment patterns. And this suggested a level of isolation between the bays, suggesting that populations in the bays represented distinct stocks. Uh, and this was later corroborated with um, genetic studies showing that the populations are actually genetically distinct. Uh, so in terms of the mechanisms actually isolating these stocks, um, physically, the bays were relatively enclosed systems. So there was little potential for dispersive currents to move Medusa out of the bays. And uh, biologically, uh, the jellyfish themselves were actually swimming away from the bay mouths. So they were found to be higher abundant, uh, uh, have higher abundances where rivers actually enter the bays and um, lower abundances at the bay mouths where they could potentially be uh, taken out of that system. Uh, so in contrast to uh, closed populations, open populations lacked, lack distinct stocks over large spatial scales. 
so this example comes from the epifaunal uh, mollusk, uh, Gonodorus nodosa, uh, in the British Isles. Uh, so sampling of populations all throughout the British Isles revealed uh, that they tended to have the same patterns of uh, allelic uh, variation, suggesting that these populations were uh, well connected. Um, and the, the mechanism for connectivity in this instance. So the, the larvae of this mollusk are, are planktotrophic. Uh, so they actually eat while they're in the plankton and they spend a relatively long time in the plankton up to three months. Uh, so for this whole period, they're uh, potentially exposed to dispersive currents. Uh, so as these two examples uh, demonstrate, physical and biological mechanisms uh, interact to determine the scales of uh, population closure or not. Um, so that's where uh, biophysical modeling comes in. Uh, so biophysical models incorporate physical and biological representations of systems. Uh, so in uh, population structure studies, these usually take the form of a hydrodynamic uh, model coupled with a biological model incorporating the behavior of species. Uh, so I'm going to show you an example uh, from uh, jellyfish. Uh, so this comes from uh, the Scyphozoan Rhizostoma octopus in the Bay of Biscay off of France. Uh, so this team actually tagged and tracked medusae in the size range of 30 to 40 centimetres in diameter uh, and found that uh, on, on flood and ebb tides, they were swimming counter current to the tides at speeds of uh, on average five centimeters per second, uh, which was an order of magnitude slower than the recorded tidal currents of uh, 20 to 50 centimeters per second. So they then developed a, a biophysical model uh, incorporating the hydrodynamics of the Bay of Biscay uh, and incorporating the behavior of the Medusa. Um, so when behavior was included, though they had this countercurrent swimming behavior, they tended to spend much longer in aggregations compared to uh, passive particles, and they had a much lower chance of uh, stranding compared to passive particles. Uh, and this is despite the fact that they were swimming at speeds and order of magnitude uh, slower than uh, the currents in that system. Uh, this is a Scyphozoan jellyfish. Uh, so their uh, sensory system includes a nerve net and only simple eye spots that can detect light. Compare that to uh, the, sens the sensory capabilities of uh, cubozoans. So cubozoans have these um, upper and lower lens eyes that are image forming and similar in structure to the eyes of uh, vertebrates and cephalopods. And cubozoans are also a highly mobile species. Um, so these are examples of maximum current, uh, maximum swim speeds recorded for uh, cubes on jellyfish taken from the literature. Uh, so just talking about the smallest individual here, because we've got um, size on the X and speed on the Y. So this is a Tripodale cystophora, and they reach a, a maximum size of about one centimeter in diameter and are capable of swimming at speeds uh, comparable to the rhizosoma octopus from the previous example, even though uh, that individual was an order of magnitude larger. And if we look at then even um, uh, large cubozoans, so Chironex fleckeri, has been recorded swimming at speeds over two times the speed of that uh, larger rhizosoma octopus. Uh, so given uh, the uh, the sensory abilities and mobility of cube zones, it's unsurprising that complex behaviors have been recorded in cube zones. Uh, so this is on uh, Trichodalia cystophora again. Uh, they've actually been recorded in laboratory avoiding obstacles. Uh, they're more active uh, during the day than at nighttime. And they've been found to actually navigate via terrestrial cues. So they will maintain positions up in the water column and look up into the mangrove canopy uh, in order to, to stay close to the edge of that canopy and avoid the faster currents in the center of the mangrove. And they've been found to, to maintain positions in uh, light shafts where the uh, copepod called prey uh, uh, are in higher abundance. So these are really complex behaviors as, like, as Mike said, uh, for an animal that doesn't have a brain. Uh, so some 
some more uh, information on cubes arms. They come in uh, two orders. So you've got the chirodropida and the charybdida. Uh, chirodropids tend to be uh, larger. Uh, and you can tell because they have multiples, uh, multiple tentacles coming off these fleshy bases on their corners. Um, and this order includes the venomous box jellyfish. Uh, charybdids tend to be much smaller. Um, so like thumb, sort of like thumb size. Uh, compared to a cryodropid, which might be like maximum 30 centimeter water size. Um, so the cryptids have a one tentacle coming off the fleshy uh, base on their corners. Uh, and this order includes uh, the Irukandji jellyfish, which are also extremely venomous. Um, <coughs> Cubozoans. Except for one species, they're all neuritic, meaning they inhabit uh, near shore environments, including uh, estuaries and uh, coastlines, and they have a bipartite life cycle, which I'll talk more about. Uh, so they have um, sexually reproducing adults, which tend to uh, broadcast, uh, broadcast spawn, and um, the planular larvae that result from that develop then into uh, uh, polyps that attach that creep around till they find something nice and then attach permanently uh, to the benthos and then that polyp uh, will pretty much fully metamorphose into uh, medusa before budding off of the bottom uh, and this is in contrast to other uh, jellyfish species where the juveniles are much more useless they they can't really swim at all whereas the the new uh, Medusa that butt off from the polyps and keeps zones are nearly fully formed, so much more capable. Um, so when we think about uh, population structures, uh, then the entirety of this life cycle would have to complete within uh, the bounds of the stock. And when we think about immigrants and emigrants, uh, as talking about these adult Medusa mainly. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, then I'm going to go into uh, the multidisciplinary studies I completed on cubes and jellyfish as part of my PhD. Uh, so I looked at uh, chirodropid, chironex fleckeri in a semi-enclosed bay, and uh, copulus sivakesi, which is a chirodropid in uh, a more inhabiting a more open uh, neutral island. Uh, so after I've discussed the results of those studies. I'd like to talk about the broader implications for the class cubes are, and then just end by briefly discussing my new research direction with the refunction. So let's meet our stars. Uh, here's uh, Chironex flecari, so the chirodropid. So it will grow to a size of around 20 centimeters, uh, and uh, it is very venomous jellyfish. Uh, compared to copula, which will grow to a maximum size of only about one centimeter. And it has a sting um, that's harmless. The Chironex fleckeri, so they're found throughout Northern Australia, uh, Indonesia, Timor-Leste, and Papua New Guinea. In contrast, copula subakesi has a much larger uh, distribution. Uh, so they're found throughout the tropics in the Pacific, Indian, and Atlantic Oceans. And within the Pacific, they're also found at a temperate latitude. So they've, in addition to um, the tropical locations that have been reported in also uh, Japan and New Zealand. Uh, so it's a really, really large uh, distribution for this species. Uh, so both species distributions overlap on uh, Northern Australia, and there's some information on the spatial scales of stocks from this location. And that comes from these uh, statoliths, which are calcified, calcified structures, uh, which make up part of the sensory system for these uh, jellyfish. Uh, so dealing with uh, current sugar first. Um, uh, so Medusa have been sampled from locations separated by hundreds of kilometers, uh, being Weaver, Townsend and Karen. And in extracting and looking at their statoliths, it's found that um, the shapes and microchemistry of the statoliths from individuals captured from these different locations varied significantly, suggesting a level of isolation. Uh, so suggesting that uh, these populations represent um, at least part of distinct stocks. 
And then within the Townsville region, uh, differences were even found in the microchemistry uh, in uh, between sites within locations separated by only tens of kilometers, again, suggesting um, stock differentiation. Uh, so for Copula civicesi, uh, their populations have been looked at at uh, Lizard Island, Kansas Council. Uh, and looking at their satellites, again, the shapes of their satellites at these locations are significantly different, suggesting that uh, they'd come from populations in uh, different stocks. Uh, so given the evidence of site within location differences for Chironex and also um, the swimming uh, ability and sensory ability of the Medusa, it was highly likely that um, stocks were differentiating at spatial scales much smaller than these hundreds of kilometers, but, it, but prior to my PhD, they hadn't been looked at at those small spatial scales. Uh, so with that in mind then, uh, I investigated uh, the population structure of a Chironix flickeri population inhabiting Port Musgrave on the Cape York Peninsula in Northern Australia. Uh, and I also investigated uh, the population structure of Copula civicesi inhabiting uh, the Nisha Island, Magnetic Island off the coast of Townsville in uh, North Queensland. Uh, so I'll just talk about uh, Chironix first. Uh, so Chironix, they're found adjacent to beaches and in Port Musgrave, they've been found on either side of the bay. Uh, so we wanted to look at if there was potential for these to represent local populations and if there was potential then for connections between them. Uh, and beyond the Port Musgrave system, if they were to leave, there are suitable estuarine habitats uh, to the north in uh, Skadun River and then uh, to the south at Weeper. Uh, and these would also represent suitable habitats for the Medusa. Uh, so for Port Musgrave itself, uh, it's a very shallow system. Um, the currents in it are driven by tides and are driven by wind. So in the the current flicker I medusa season, which runs from October to April, that wind tends to come from the east. Uh, and we estimated that the residence time of this system uh, was between 40 to 56 days, so that's a relatively long residence time. Uh, so given the, the small opening of this bay into the Gulf Cup area and the long residence time, this system uh, would be considered physically relatively closed. So then we wanted to find out a about the uh, jellyfish's swimming capabilities uh, in comparison to the local current speeds in this relatively close system. Uh, so we went to the near shore waters uh, where you find jellyfish, so adjacent to beaches. This is uh, Red, Red Beach uh, in Port Musgrove. Uh, and we measured the swim speeds of Medusa and also the local current speeds. And we found that the average swim speed of Medusa was almost double the average uh, neutral current speed. And comparing the maximum, uh, so the maximum was uh, 16.6 centimeters per second compared to the average current speed, uh, 2.7 centimeters per second. So the maximum uh, swim speed was uh, greater than five times the local current speed. So compared to the local currents, these jellyfish are really exceptional swimmers. But we also looked at their behavior. Uh, so we observed them maintaining positions near the shore, but not beaching. Uh, we observed them swimming up and down parallel to the shore and we observed them avoiding obstacles. Uh, so with the swimming capabilities and behaviors, we developed a behavior model. And then this was coupled with a hydrodynamic model of uh, the currents in Port Musgrave to develop the, the final biophysical model. Uh, now to capture the, the nearshore behaviors of Medusa and also the fine nearshore hydrodynamic features, we needed a, a fine resolution. Um, so we had a, a grid size of 55 meter cells. So uh, for context in other biophysical modeling studies uh, that look at nearshore waters, um, it's not uncommon to have grid cells in the order of hundreds of meters. So this is really quite fine. Um, and this is just a, a, an output from a hydrodynamic model showing that in these near shore waters inhabited by the jellyfish, you get much uh, slower currents compared to as you move out into the bay. So we get significant current shear. Uh, so now uh, to look at 
the model retention of Medusa uh, in these nearshore waters. Uh, so I'm going to show you now is two movies. Uh, so on the left is a model run where Medusa aren't given any behaviors, so they're passive. On the right, um, they've got the behavioral set that I described in the previous slides. Uh, so for the color of the grid cells, the, the warmer the color indicates uh, the more Medusa in that grid cell. And this is going to show uh, 14 days of simulation. Uh, so you can see it's a bit jumpy, but um, in the passive model, there's much less retention in these nearshore waters compared to when behaviors are included. Uh, so this strongly suggests that behaviors are uh, incredibly important in maintaining the, the nearshore aggregations of jellyfish. And these nearshore aggregations could represent local populations. And this becomes clear when you look at the base scale. So this is the same model run with behavior, but zoomed out. And you can see um, these little red areas representing um, aggregations of jellyfish and potential local populations. And we did get connectivity between the different sides of the bay. Uh, so at the base scale, when behavior was included, uh, we got very high retention so within the bay. So 98.4% of the Medusa that were initially released were still in the bay um, after 14 days. Uh, and if we look at the passive scenario, which I don't have an image for, uh, this is more akin to like the early life history stages that don't have any uh, swimming ability. Uh, so we got 100% retention in the passive model. So this suggests that in terms of closing the population cycle, those early life stages are very unlikely to leave the system. And all this evidence taken together strongly suggests that uh, Port Musgrave uh, represents a, a stock for the, the population of Karnak Slickeri inhabiting Port Musgrave represents a stock. Uh, so in summary, uh, Port Musgrave is a physically uh, semi-enclosed habitat. The Medusa are exceptional swimmers compared to the local current speeds and they exhibited complex behaviours. And these behaviours were uh, integral to maintaining the near aggregations, which were represented local populations. Uh, there was high retention at the base scale when behaviours were included and when behaviour wasn't included. Um, providing strong evidence that the early life history stages would not be dispersed um, from the system. Uh, and I forgot to mention, but there's actually evidence from the literature that then the early life stages are unlikely to be spending long periods of time in the water column um, exposed to currents anyway. They're, they've got highly retentive characteristics. Um, so all this information taken together, it provides strong evidence that the population of current like are inhabiting Port Musgrave is a robust stock. So on to uh, Copulus of Akizi at Magnetic Island. Uh, so the currents around Magnetic Island are driven by tides. Uh, they're driven by uh, wind, so wind-driven currents. And uh, these currents interact with uh, topography, forming features like eddies. And within this region, there's also um, some influence from the regional forcing. Uh, so comparatively, uh, Magnetic Island is a much more open system compared to Port Musgrave. Uh, when I talk about that regional forcing, uh, within the trade wind season, which runs from uh, April to November and overlaps with the Medusa season, which runs from September to November, you get this lagoonal current forming in the Great Barrier Lagoon forced by the predominant southeasterly wind. And that would run uh, right past Magnetic Island. You also, uh, for the Great Barrier Reef as a whole, the South Equatorial current hits the outer GBR and forces a lot of the currents within the GBR system. Uh, but before we could there are uh, answer questions about the population structure of Copper Sivakizi at Magnetic Island. We had to first address where actually are the Medusa in the system. And we first addressed that at a very fine spatial scale. So looking at 
the change in their abundance with um, depth and habitat. Uh, to do that, we developed these uh, JCAMs. So they're essentially a, a torch um, paired with a camera and the jellyfish are attracted to the light of the torch and recorded by the camera. And we took the maximum number of jellyfish in a frame of video over a 30 minute deployment as a measure of their abundance. So these JCAMs were deployed in a 400 by two meter grid, um, which had three different sampling depths. So uh, shallow, mid and uh, deep sampling. Uh, these depths also correlated to um, differences in habitat availability. And I'll discuss more about that in the next slide. So these are the results of that uh, JCAM sampling. You can see at uh, shallow and mid depths, um, you got high abundances of copula cipicis and medusa, um, and there was high to moderate habitat availability. So a shallow site might typically have looked like this, um, where there's very full habitat, uh, dominated by sargassum algae, but there's some hard and soft coral mix in there. Uh, and a, a mid-depth site might look like this, uh, where you get uh, about 50% coverage of uh, sargassum algae and coral compared to the, uh, the deep sites where habitat was practically absent and the abundance of Medusa was really low. So this suggests um, that Copia cervicesia Medusa maintain a highly restricted distribution, restricted to shallow depths with at least moderate habitat availability. Uh, so then we ask the question, how are these little tiny jellyfish a centimeter uh, in size, maintaining this highly restricted distribution in this open system. Uh, so in a similar trend to the Karanek study, we wanted to know their swimming speeds versus the local current speeds. Perform this step-up experiment where after an accumulation period, uh, the speed in a, in a flow tank with a jellyfish in it, uh, a, a speed a water flow of three centimeters was put through that tank. Uh, and that was maintained for five minutes. And then after five minutes, it was brought up to six centimetres per second and maintained for another five minutes and then plus to nine centimetres per second and so on until the jellyfish uh, stopped swimming. And with this experimental setup, we were able to determine the, the critical, we were able to determine the critical swim speed of Medusa. Uh, so that's the speed at which uh, the swim speed that Medusa can maintain for an extended period of time. And we were also able to uh, calculate uh, the sprint speed of Medusa, which uh, was taken as the maximum speed they could sustain for at least half of a five minute trial interval, so two and a half minutes. And then to measure the uh, current speed, we had these uh, drogues. Uh, so they were uh, uh, perspex sheets uh, weighed down by a small fishing sinker. Uh, with a one meter rope attached to the top and a, a buoy at the top of that rope with a light uh, so we could find it during our nighttime sampling. So we had 101 drug deployments uh, and uh, they were left out for 10 minutes and from the difference in positions from the start and end position, we could work out the mean current speed and direction. Uh, so to show you some of those results, you can see, so these depth ranges correlate with um, the depth ranges we perform the JCAM sampling. Um, and the speed, uh, current speed on the Y, uh, tended to uh, increase uh, with depth. Uh, and the critical swim speed of the Medusa was faster than almost all of the current speeds that we measured in, um, in shallow waters. And it was close to the median current speeds um, measured in at mid and deep depths. And for the sprint speed of the Medusa, um, that was faster than pretty much all of the current speeds we measured across all the depths. So, so like Chironex, this little uh, copula jellyfish uh, is a really uh, excellent swimmer uh, especially compared to the local current speeds in the near shore waters that it inhabits. Uh, so we also looked at their behaviors. Um, 
these these jellyfish are nocturnal, um, as found from laboratory studies and um, plankton toes. Uh, they maintain positions near the bottom, uh, as determined from depth stratified plankton toes conducted in the field. They have an attraction to habitat, as demonstrated um, with the restricted distribution of the JCAM sampling, and also in a habitat choice laboratory experiment. Uh, and interestingly, they have this attachment to habitat behavior because uh, copulus of Kesey, um have these sticky pads on the tops of their bells. Uh, so they're capable of attaching to hard surfaces. And they're, this is time and current speed dependent. So when they're inactive during the day, they're more likely to be attached uh, to the tank or to habitat. Um, and uh, when I say current speed dependent, that information comes from the step-up experiment that we performed. Uh, so for 17 of the 41 Medusa that were trialed, the trial had to be suspended because the, the, the jellyfish Medusa had actually attached uh, to the tank to avoid being uh, pushed back by the flow. So again, um, all, these incorpor all these behaviors were incorporated into behavior model uh, and uh, coupled with a hydrodynamic model of the current surrounding the island. Uh, but in this instance, uh, so we needed a fine resolution near shore to capture the behaviors of Medusa on relatively narrow habitat bands, which were only about 200, millimeter, uh, 200 um, meters wide, um, and to capture the near shore hydrodynamic features. Uh, but we also needed a large domain because of those regional scale forcings. So we needed uh, to capture that lagoonal current and also the inflow um, from the South Equatorial current that drives a lot of the currents in the GBL system. Um, so with models, the, the more grid cells you have, the higher the computational load. Uh, so we couldn't have had a fine resolution everywhere. Um, the computer would have exploded. Uh, so we needed this um, variable resolution mesh. Uh, so for that, we used a finite element model and it was uh, this slim model. So second generation model, not more by session model. Uh, so, uh, I just want to spend a bit more time talking about the behaviors that were modeled. Um, we had, we trialed two different behavior models. Uh, the first one, oh, so, so, so both of them, sorry, uh, the behavior of jellyfish uh, was dependent on their position in relation to habitat and also the time of day. Uh, jellyfish were considered on habitat if they were within 100 meters of a habitat midline. And they were considered off habitat if they were beyond this uh, distance. Um, so for the continual model, jellyfish on habitat at nighttime would continually swim to the habitat midline. They would maintain positions near the bottom and so were only exposed to half the depth average current velocity. The jellyfish off habitat at nighttime uh, also maintained uh, near bottom uh, positions but had no directional swimming cue. Uh, jellyfish on habitat during the day would attach to that habitat and jellyfish off habitat uh, during the day um, would maintain positions near the bottom. So we're, we're exposed to half the depth of the current, but again, had no directional swimming cues. So the, uh, the dependent model is a bit more, is a bit more complex, but the only difference is um, we included a current speed dependent attachment behavior akin to the jellyfish in the swim trials attaching to the tank to avoid being pushed back by the flow. Uh, so with this, if the current speed was less than our set cutoff, the jellyfish would attach to the habitat rather than, uh, than swim. Oh, sorry. So if the current speed was greater than our, um, our assigned cutoff, the jellyfish would attach to the habitat rather than swim. And if it was less than that cutoff, uh, they would swim to the habitat midline, like in the continuum model. Uh, so I'm going to show you some movies again. So the continual model results are on this uh, left pane and the dependent model results are on the right pane. Uh, the habitat band is this um, black shape and the jellyfish are these grey dots. Uh, so in both of these simulations, 
the swim speed is set to the critical swim speed of 4.9 centimeters per second. So the only difference is that um, current speed dependent attachment to habitat behavior at night time. Uh, so you can see with the continuum model, Medusa quickly lost from uh, their reefal habitat, whereas in the dependent model, um, they're able to maintain their positions on this reefal habitat. So um, biologically, the dependent model is much more realistic as it aligns with um, the restricted distribution found in that JCAM survey. Uh, so this, yeah, strongly suggests that jellyfish can't be swimming all the time at night, so they need some sort of selective activity pattern to maintain their restricted distribution. Uh, so armed with this information, uh, we wanted to then expand our um, JCAM sampling. So we put uh, JCAMs out uh, along the east coast of Magnetic Island, so from Florence Bay, but Arthur Bay, Alma North, Alma Bay, Jeffrey Bay, Picnic Bay, Mill Reef. Uh, and we found peaks in abundance at Florence Bay and Jeffrey Bay, but they were present in uh, all bays on the East Coast and they were absent from Middle Reef. Uh, so then this, in combination with um, the work we'd done comparing the behavior models allowed us to expand the biophysical modeling. So then we were able to ask questions about population structure. So in the expansion, uh, we were able to release jellyfish over the entire distribution for a whole jellyfish season, and we concentrated on the dependent model, which was the only one which gave biologically realistic results. Uh, in terms of what we were looking for, we looked at the potential for uh, connectivity between the different um, bays that housed Medusa, and we looked at the potential for any connectivity between the island population and any mainland populations. Uh, so for um, interbay connectivity, we found high self-seeding rates, so with high within bay retention. So looking at Nelly Bay as an example, Medusa released from Nelly Bay tended to remain within Nelly Bay for the duration of their lifetimes. Uh, but there was some float over. So Medusa from Nelly Bay were also recorded in Picnic Bay to the south and Jeffrey Bay to the north. Uh, but these interbay um, excursions happened over relatively small spatial scales. So the, the maximum distance a jellyfish traveled between bays was uh, 3.7 kilometers. Um, so this is given the high within bay retention um, and the limited um, distances traveled by Medusa, it strongly suggests that the bays represent uh, connected local populations of sea seven kings in Medusa. Uh, so then uh, looking at the potential for connectivity with the mainland, what you're looking at here is um, the maximum extent of export of Medusa from Magnetic Island over the entire uh, jellyfish season. Uh, so what I did was uh, I plotted the positions of all Medusa lost from um, the magnetic island habitat through time. So it looks like a lot, but this actually represents less than 0.1% of all the seeded Medusa. Um, interestingly, when Medusa were lost, they didn't cross the coastal boundary layer. So no Medusa that were released from magnetic island made it to the coast. They all tend to travel longshore likely um, transported by that regional lagoonal current and also by um, wind-driven currents driven by the pre prevailing southeasterly wind. Uh, so this is strong evidence uh, that the magnetic island population of Sisa the Kizi Medusa represents a distinct stop given the limited potential for connectivity with the mainland. Uh, but within a stock, so you'd need the whole life cycle to be uh, completed within the bounds of that magnetic island system. Uh, and this is highly likely uh, for copula sibikizi. So they're a really exceptional and unique little jellyfish. They don't actually broadcast form like other cubes islands, 
they actually do this wedding dance where the male, uh, they entangle the tentacles and the male uh, directly transfers sperm to the female. Uh, so there's no potential for dispersion of eggs or sperm. And then the female has this sticky embryo sac, uh, which she is thought to selectively attach to habitat. Uh, so there's going to be no dispersion of embryos either. And the planular larvae that emerge from the embryo sac are also sticky. So they have been found um, to stick to, to uh, objects in tanks. Um, uh, so they're unlikely to go very far either. Uh, for the polyps, they're sea they're not going anywhere. But um, there was a study recently where, um, uh, this is one of Mike's um, honor students, he looked for, um, copula sifakese DNA outside of the Medusa season. So when it was found, it had to be the polyps and it was found in the same habitat that the adults inhabit. Uh, so suggesting that the polyp habitat overlaps with the adult habitat, which is a really cool result. Um, and again, because uh, the, the newly formed Medusa that bud off the polyps are nearly fully formed, they're, they're less useless than other jellyfish juveniles and they'll grow quickly into competent swimmers. So a fast growth rate has also been reported for um, copula sibichese in Medusa. So in summary for copula on Magnetic Island, they inhabit a, a physically relatively open habitat. Uh, they have strong swimming Medusa relative to local currents that have complex behaviors. Uh, they likely have uh, base scale local populations uh, maintained um, by the behaviors of Medusa, and they have really sticky early life history stages. Uh, so taken in all, it's highly likely that Magnetic Island represents a stop for copula sibichese. So looking at the wider implications for cubes islands, uh, my PhD studies included uh, two species from two different orders in two vastly different habitats, one semi-enclosed and one open. Uh, both the species were neuritic. Both had swim, speech much, swim speeds much, much faster than local current speeds, and both had complex behaviours. Uh, in all that contributed to the isolation of stocks at medial, medium spatial scales in both species. For other cubosomes, most of them except one species, uh, neuritic. Uh, fast swim speeds have been recorded in other species and complex behaviors have been recorded in other species. Uh, so potentially um, the maintenance of stocks at medium spatial scales of tens of kilometers is widespread among cube zones. Uh, back, so back to the distribution of uh, copula, it seems that uh, everything about the species, so the behavior of Medusa and the early life history uh, seems to be adapted to limit dispersal potential. So then their widespread, widespread distribution is a bit of a contradiction. And this strongly suggests that uh, cryptic or incipient species uh, could be making up this distribution. And this is an active, an active area of research at the moment. Uh, so that's it for my Cuba's Island story for now. Um, I briefly wanted to talk about uh, what I'm researching within my postdoc for the reef function hub. Uh, so I'm looking at a benthic pelagic coupling and coral reef systems and the role of currents in mediating these linkages. Uh, so I've started off by looking at the sediment cycle or sediment dynamics. Uh, sediments are present on coral reefs in three reservoirs. So they're present in off reef sediment apron. They're present, uh, they're present up in the water column and they're present on uh, the reef substratum itself. But these uh, reservoirs are linked and uh, the currents are the primary mechanism moving sediments between these reservoirs. As an example, uh, waves and currents can uh, remobilize uh, benthic sediments back up into the water column. And sediments in the water column can undergo sedimentation to become benthic sediments 
but that's as they're being entrained uh, by currents. Uh, so it's a lot of uh, different fields have uh, quantified sediments on coral reefs, including uh, oceanography, uh, uh, geology, and uh, biology. Um, and given this, this wide uh, literature in disparate fields, we wanted to actually look into how well understood these reservoirs and the linkages between them are. So we performed a, a quantitative evaluation of the literature uh, on sediments of coral reefs. And from we, so we looked at studies that had measured sediments of coral reefs and actually um, extracted information on what those studies measured. So these are some results from that analysis. Uh, so the nodes in this network uh, represent reservoirs or processes. Uh, so we've got uh, water column sediments, off free sediments, on roof sediments, uh, remobilization and sedimentation there. Um, the size of the node shows how often uh, that reservoir process was quantified in isolation. And the width of the linkage between nodes shows how often um, those nodes were studied in concert in the same study. Uh, so just a quick take home from this, water column sediments and off reef sediments uh, tended to be measured much more frequently than on reef sediments. Uh, as a consequence, it seems that on reef sediments, their accumulation and uh, their removal are relatively poorly understood as shown by these thin lines uh, connecting on reef to the other nodes. And so a main aim of my postdoc now is to start uh, filling in these poorly understood linkages. Uh, so thanks for listening. Um, there's a lot of collaborators involved in this work and I'd particularly like to thank uh, my PhD supervisors, Michael Kingsford and uh, Eric Kleinsky. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, the funding bodies that made it possible. So the Australian Lions Foundation, uh, Trip Water, Australian Research Council and ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Studies. So thanks for listening. And uh, any questions?